Today I'm going to be talking uh, a little bit about, as, as Celia mentioned, uh, my uh, grant-funded research uh, on uh, ethics in human subjects research. So uh, it is uh, a little bit of a hodgepodge of studies that I've done, but for the most part they will focus uh, on uh, empirical assessment of informed consent, voluntariness, uh, autonomy, social harms in research involving individuals with substance use disorders. Most of my work has been done with substance use uh, individuals with substance use disorders uh, and uh, also individuals in the criminal justice system. So I like to sometimes refer to them as doubly vulnerable and if they have health conditions too, uh, as many of our clients do. Many of our HIV positive, I do a lot of research in HIV as well, uh, but generally speaking we'll be talking about these ethical issues. As an inter as in way of an introduction, uh, most of you know what the informed consent is and what, the, uh, what its purpose is. Uh, it is really a key, a critical component of eth uh, ethical research that seeks to ensure understanding of rights and Okay, I think this is going to be recurring here. If you push, if you push the last one, oh, oh then the wrong. Okay, I'll do that next time. Again, so. um, understanding rights and protections, uh, enabling them to make autonomous decisions uh, of their own free will regarding participation. Uh, research has generally demonstrated really very poor rates of comprehension and importantly retention. I'll be talking a, a bit about retention in the work that I've done uh, uh, of consent information. Uh, because as you heard Dr. Fisher uh, mention yesterday, it's really not just enough to sort of know it when, I think you alluded to this, but not just enough to know it when you're signing the contract, so to speak, or uh, following initial consent, but it's, it's very important, and I'll come back to this, to retain it over time and throughout the study. And it's particularly true for vulnerable populations such as uh, substance users. As an overview, this, uh, our, the presentation today will review the primary tenets of informed consent. I'm not going to get into a lot of detail with that. I know there, you have a talk uh, later this week uh, on that. We're going to discuss ways in which the informed consent process can be compromised among individuals with substance use disorders and vulnerable populations. And we're going to discuss the potential for undetected social harms uh, that may be experienced uh, by this and other vulnerable populations. And uh, we're going to provide practical evidence-based methods to address some of these issues. So, uh, generally speaking, this has bro been broken down in several different ways. This is more or less the legal breakdown, but essentially the basic principles of informed consent are that they should be, it should be intelligent, knowing, and voluntary. Intelligence really means the capacity for understanding uh, information, appreciating information that is uh, presented to you. Uh, Knowing is really being able to understand uh, and retain the information. And uh, voluntary, of course, means that you're autonomous, that you're able to make decisions of your own free will. So in terms of knowingness, in terms of intelligence, um, this refers, as I said, to the intrinsic capacity to understand, uh, appreciate, and express a choice. So some individuals may be so cognitively compromised that they may not be able to really fully appreciate or understand what you're being, what you're told to them, you're telling to them about the study, about the risks and benefits, etc. And a lot of this, in, in terms of substance use, uh, individuals with substance use disorders uh, may have to do with their chronic use and the effects on their uh, their cognitive functioning. It may have neurological effects. Uh, and the primary strategy here, still to date, seems to be to have uh, used legal surrogates. Now, again, there's different levels of, of uh, limited intelligence. So I'm not trying to say that's true for everyone. 
certainly uh, if they if they are amenable to certain other skills building or other types of uh, training that can be adjusted uh, there may be treatment that can be used but we're talking here about individuals who really can't get it and that in that case um, it's it's something that is largely immutable and not amenable to inter interventions so in our research, we tended to focus on the other two, knowingness and voluntariness. So in terms of knowingness, it really refers to one's accurate understanding and appreciation of the study and their involvement in the study. So all the things that Celia talked about yesterday, uh, they uh, really need to understand the, what, you know, what their the role in the study is, what the risks and benefits of the study are, uh, what their, uh, you know, if things like, you know, can I drop out, if I, if I want to drop out, all of the things that uh, are important to know about the study. Um, but again, these can be um, affected too by their sometimes even temporary impairment um, or some slight cognitive impairment that, or even in terms of criminal justice clients, maybe just even their, the fact that they have their liberty and in jeopardy and that they may be facing, they may be faced with some really serious consequences and they may not be in the right state of mind. So it could be contextual too. Uh, when you think about someone sort of sitting there in a drug court or in a jail cell and you know, somebody comes over and says, you know, do you want to be in a study? You know, yeah, th there's coercion, there's all kinds of things that can happen, but individuals may not really be listening. They might be thinking about something completely different. They may be distracted. And there may be developmental and, and those uh, environmental factors too that, that play a part. Um, as well as limited education, poor nutrition, comorbid health and mental health problems, etc. So what, what has been done for knowing that? Um, to address knowingness. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with many of these strategies. The general aim is to overcome those perceived cognitive limitations or deficits and simplify the cognitive task. So for those of you who have been around for a while or even for a little while, you've heard, you know, it has to be at a sixth grade reading level. Uh, we need to uh, increase the font size. We need to use supplementary materials, and maybe if we put it in brochure form, or if we show a video, uh, there's lots of other ways to address this. Uh, one, of, one of the uh, techniques that actually has some uh, good degree of research support are quizzes with corrected feedback. So it's kind of like trying to teach individuals, give them the corrected feedback on the questions that they get wrong. Uh, and then to address those and teach them again. So it's sort of like just providing the correct information and sort of over learning. Not really over learning, but making, ensuring that they over time uh, really understand what the study is and what the risks and benefits are. So in one study, um, NIDA funded study, we examined uh, administering uh, this, this process of corrective feedback. We did it in the study of drug court clients, and it was done. Uh, and, and drug court is in perhaps the most um, vulnerable population, but again, it is they are vulnerable. Okay, they have their liberty of jeopardy, as I mentioned. They've been arrested. They volunteered to participate in this in, in this uh, process of drug court, and so there's lots of things going on. Now, the concept, the consent quiz um, was. Uh, presented at three monthly intervals and during the consent quiz uh, the consent quiz would evaluate their understanding of study protocol and procedures so like sort of really the very easy stuff like you know I have to come in for an intake I have to fill out these forms I you know I have to come in for follow-up so really the procedures the second part are really the risks and benefits of participation and this really has to do with some of the things, again, that was, were mentioned yesterday. What, what harm could come of my uh, participation? What are the things that I really should understand and know? 
And human subject protections, of course, are things like uh, if I'm harmed in any way, who, who can I contact? What is my recourse? Uh, what can I do to you know, fix the problem or address the problem? So you can already begin to understand that it's not just understanding the consent at the time of consent. Because if I tell you at the time of consent that this medication or this process uh, may increase your blood pressure six months down the line, but six months later you go to your doctor and you're diagnosed with hypertension and you don't remember that connection, what, what, good, is that? what good was that warning? Or if I was told that you know, this is completely confidential and your boss, no one will find out about this, and you know, a year down the line, my boss says, hey, you, why were you in that drug study? What was that about? Knowing that there's recourse, knowing that there's things that you can do to, uh, to, uh, to address those issues. Half of the participants in this study were received corrective feedback on the informed consent answers on the quiz. And, uh, and then we compared, the, uh, and half did not. So both groups got the consent quizzes, but half did not receive corrected feedback. Uh, and compared to the consent quiz scores of those who did not receive uh, corrected feedback over time, uh, that's what we did. Here's, here's, here are the questions. And importantly, I, I just want to emphasize this because this is true with uh, virtually all of our research. We really think that the consent quizzes that were out there uh, for the longest period of time, and I know Celia knows this, and, and, and many of you know this, we're really CYA, okay? Mm -hmm. Everybody knows what that means, right? So they were like, you know, questions like, you're in a study, yes or no? <laughs> uh, you're gonna get paid for this study, yes or no? Uh, you can drop out of this study where they sort of give you the answer, and then they say, you know, true or false. Uh, so those kinds of, uh, recognition questions and sort of give me questions really don't fit the bill. What we really knew from the very beginning and with help of our CAB and help of our expert panel, we were able to develop uh, what we, we really wanted was recall because that's what's going to happen in the real world. You're not going to be sitting around and saying, okay, let me peruse that uh, consent form that uh, was given to me three months ago. Or let me let me look at these. You know, let let me think about these very simplistic questions. So I'm not going to read all of these questions, but you can see they're all open-ended. What's the purpose of the study? How many study groups are there? How many study uh, groups differ? So you can see the first part is about the protocol and procedures. The second part is really about the risks and benefits, and the third part is about those human subject protections that we discussed. And uh, it's important for, for me to say also, these questions aren't just given, it's not just an interview where we, we ask you and then you give us your answer. There are prompts. So we don't just say, you know, what is randomization? Or if somebody says, uh, um, if you were asked, for example, uh, how did we decide what group you were assigned to? And they said, oh, randomization. We're not gonna go with just their simple state, they, they could have remembered that word and still not really appreciate what it means. So the, uh, the research assistants, the trainees in, in, this, in these studies were, were uh, trained to actually pursue a better understanding and appreciation of what that meant. So they couldn't just say randomization, they had to say, okay, that would be followed up according to our protocol with, with questions like, you know, what does that mean? What does randomization mean? And how was that done? And they had to give some answer that sort of fit the idea that, uh, you know, it was done by chance, it had an equal opportunity of getting either placement, that it was fair, that kind of thing. And we did a lot of rounds of training and there was really a high uh, iterative reliability by the time we were done. So what did we find? Well, with corrective feedback, this graph is not very uh, amazing. Look, the, you know, the differences here between the feedback group and the new feedback group uh, are not um, astonishing, but they were significant. So over four um, administrations, 
there was about a two point increase. Okay, and it was clinically, it was uh, statistically significant, but most would argue it's not clinically significant, right? We're, we're increasing it a bit, it's showing some kind of effect, but uh, it's not, it's certainly not sufficient. So the next thing we thought about, we scratched our heads and we said, well, why is that? You know, okay, we're giving them the corrective feedback, we're giving them the answers. What, what possible other reasons might there be for people not really understanding and retaining this information. And the, you know, it, in our advisory group, there was like, a, you know, we all had sort of like the same epiphany. It was like, you know, guess what? Some people may not just be the, all that interested in participating in your study. It's kind of like, you know, anything you buy, a car or a bank loan or whatever, when you see the small print, how many people are really motivated to read that? You know, so, uh, they might hear a blah, 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 blah study, a wah, 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 um, payment, a wah, 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 you know, whatever it is. Yes, and that, and that might be it. So we thought, well, why don't we examine motivation? And what's a, the best way to examine motivation? Well, um, perhaps the best way would be to look at, uh, is to pay individuals to recall it. Now, that wasn't necessarily our, an, our, our plan going forward in the future for what we were going to do with it and, you know, our, our practical plan, but it's a very good way of examining whether or not people can retain information. So participants in this study, uh, grant-funded study, were um, randomized, uh, there were two groups. Uh, both groups were uh, asked to complete a standardized consent quiz. Uh, we never, we never make, we never use in our studies. We never use um, uh, mock studies. You know, we always try to build them into an existing, ongoing clinical trial. So just to have sort of uh, more, uh, more ecological validity, if you will. Uh, prior to initiating the consent process, all participants were informed that they would be completing a consent quiz uh, 30 days later. Half of the participants were also informed that they would receive $5 for every correct answer on the 15-item quiz. So they had the opportunity to earn as much as $75 if they got them all right. Okay, so now we're, we're incentivizing one group, we're not incentivizing the other. Okay, now answer me this, if one group can do it when they're getting paid and one group can, can't do it when they're not getting paid, does that mean they have the capacity to remember? Yeah. Right, of course, right? If, if I could go pay my dog to fly around the <laughs> block, okay? Um, well, it's a kind of an odd analogy, but guess and he flies around the block, guess what? What I know is one thing, is that he can fly, right? So here, the issue to try to dis dismantle that and to really understand, you know, whether or not they have the capacity, is this a cognitive deficit, like everyone was saying, or is it really just somebody's motivation uh, is the question. And here's what we found. So we found, uh, as you can see, in the red bars are the incentivized clients, in the blue uh, bars are the control clients, and as you can see in terms of the total score, um, the protocol score, the protections, and the risk benefits, you can see that there's a whopping increase uh, in the ability to recall information. Um, if you incentivize clients. Now, so we looked at this and we said, wow, this is great, very cool, but 65% is still not really clinically significant, okay? And when we looked at it, it, it sort of explained about 50% of the variance, which is good, that's a lot of variance, but that meant there's still a lot more to explore. So we thought, what if we use a remedial strategy like the corrected feedback and combine it with a motivational strategy, like the incentives, 
And maybe then we can get up both, both issues. Maybe we can motivate clients to understand and also adjust some of the remedial issues. Uh, so we evaluated the efficacy of a combined uh, process, a procedure. Uh, participants received either monthly consent quizzes with corrective feedback uh, and incentives, or monthly consent quizzes only with no corrective feedback and no incentives. And we hypothesized, of course, that the combination of the two would have a high, even a, a greater effect on their ability to uh, understand and recall. So what did we find? Well, we found that, um, you know, again, over time, what we found is that uh, at quiz one, uh, there was a slight difference, not significant. But over time, by quiz five, throughout the process, throughout the grant study, you can see that the control group actually decreased. Their understanding and recall of the information decreased. Now these are important issues, like the ones I mentioned earlier. These are important issues like the ones that Celia mentioned yesterday. You know, you know. remember when the, in the role play where the person was like, I don't remember you saying that, that you were going to uh, disclose this to my significant other, you know? So it's an ongoing process. And I have this argument sometimes, discussion, with uh, researchers <laughs> all the time where they say, no, absolutely not. And they treat it like, it's, like, it, like it literally is a car sale. Yeah. If they understand it at the time that you consent them, they sign their name, your, your job is done. And all the talking to them about, what about if, they're, if they get hypertension? What if one of these negative events happen? What if, you know, they, they don't want to hear about it. So that, that's kind of what we're dealing with sometimes in, with the opposition we get with, uh, not, not, not just with uh, fellow researchers, but with IRBs, et cetera. But as you can see here, in terms of the total score on the quiz, there is a, a significant increase in retention, right? 83%. So we were setting sort of a 70% bar. And at this point, we really consider that clinical significance, not just statistical significance. Can I ask you a question? Yes, please. What was the, for the 83%, or for either of them, like what was the distribution like? Meaning like were you getting like a cluster at like 100 and a cluster at 50 or was it really actually like pretty even across? It was board? pretty even across. I wish I had that data for you, but it was, I'd, I'd be happy to send it to you. And, and, it's, it's, and it is published, so I think we have it in there. Okay, and also like by demographics, like where did you, I mean I'm assuming you looked at this, but like and maybe you'll get to that. We did, we controlled for some of the real, um, the obvious ones, but we looked at your, your typical um, sort of uh, gender, race, ethnicity, but at also um, uh, earnings was a big one. So we're, whenever we're doing anything with incentives and contingency management, we're always careful to examine that because that's the most obvious one. You know, if I if I have a much higher income, will those small incentives uh, seem to work? And they do. They seem to to work. Pardon? My free food yes, exactly, exactly. This is when we were looking not just at the total score, but at the score in the protocol, their understanding of what like sort of the methods were and what they had to do. And as you can see, that increased significantly. Uh, I, in my opinion, clinically, statistically, and clinically, um, it improved uh, for their understanding of protections. And it also increased in terms of their risks. This was a little lower because there weren't a lot of risks associated with the study. There were some perceived risks, but uh, not a lot of risks mentioned. You know, some breach of confidentiality, things that could happen, but were likely not to. And in terms of benefits, the same thing. You know, benefits were sort of altruism, and you know that it was helping this, helping the field, etc. So in summary, we it, we it seems that we can improve the knowingness and retention of consent information among substance users who enter research studies. Um, and one of the most effective strategies are likely uh, to address both remedial and motivational issues. Um, I these talks are incredibly fun to give. 
Um, but I'm, I'm still very um, dismayed at the lack of sort of implementation of many of these strategies. I mean, here we are in 2017, and no one is requiring us to do consent quizzes, val valid consent quizzes, open-ended, you know, recollection, not just recall rather than rec uh, recognition. And it, it really frustrates me. I see even in our own institute sometimes somebody has like a two, and, it, and there are groups that do do use it. So I, I'm not, not trying to blame everyone, but even in my own institution, I see these sort of CYA kind of two, three item consent quizzes, which. So one, based on what you're saying, one of the issues is, what is the criteria for saying they don't understand? Because right. I think that's the real worry of investigators. Right. That what is a clinically significant, and, and for some of the vulnerable population, what does that mean? So for example, with, with you know, lower economic drug using populations, they come all the way and then they're told they can't be in it because they didn't understand. You know, it's one thing right. if they're in withdrawal or, or you know, they're high. But, but there's another in the sense that we're saying you can't be in it because you don't understand this. And so I guess that's my, that's my question. How, I have two questions. One is how do we decide mm -hmm. what is actually un, uh, uh, acceptable understanding? One thing is do we compare it to some college person mm -hmm. and is, is that fair? Uh, do we grade it on what we think is the most salient variables and then do we know <laughs> which yeah. ones those are uh, to them in, the, in their life? Um, and then if we do develop some criteria, um, then do we pay them if they came yeah. anyway because it's kind of unfair to them that, that mm -hmm. we recruited them? So, so, um, so a lot of money is spent on grants for all kinds of purposes, and we all know that, right? But um, I think that these ethical protections are, are very important, and I think it, it doesn't it doesn't really cost a lot to you know for some of the the payment. And it depends on the study. But to answer your first question, I think it is really a multifaceted approach. I think we do really need to uh, look at our talk to our CABs to uh, do some qualitative research with our clients, to talk to expert panels as we did here, uh, to identify the major, um, major uh, elements that they need to recall. Uh, but I think that it's not um, yes or no you can be in a study. It's really about uh, going further with your consent process. So remember, it's called informed consent, right? Our, our goal, our, 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 really our charge is to ensure that they're informed. So sometimes it takes, um, it can take several times. It can take a lot of work to actually get clients to understand. Now if they are, they have a level of impairment, as we talked, you know, something with their intelligence or their level of cognitive functioning, that uh, there are still possibilities of getting a surrogate or someone else but depending on the nature of the study yes you may have we may have to in my opinion we may have to say uh, you know it's there they, they can't be accepted into the study and I know I realize that brings up issues of procedural justice and and other things uh, that could we could talk about in another uh, another discussion, but I, but uh, my sense is that their their protections they can't venture into a contract or something or you know a study uh, that for which they really do not understand the consequences. So yes. Okay. So we still we as a field mm -hmm. still don't know what information people need to make a decision whether to participate or not, mm -hmm. right? We have regulatory requirements, but sure. we don't have a good sense of how people make a decision to participate beyond the trust mm -hmm. piece. Um, so, there, but there's a set of information, just intuitively, there's a set of information that they need when they're deciding whether to participate or not. Mm -hmm. Then there's another set of information that they need as once they're in the study, as you were saying, the risks, the right to withdraw, all of that, that they need to 
sort of remember down the road during their participation. And in the in a single consent process, right. we don't differentiate those. We put them in the order that our IRBs make us put them in, and we give the information. And so when five months later, or however many months it was, it seems that there's a smaller amount of information that subjects would reasonably even need to know about. Mm -hmm. Then very and then it's a very different set of information than they need to use to make the decision to participate. Right. And right. and how do we how do we get at those differences and have appropriate expectations? No, that's a very, very good point. I think to answer your so first of all because this, you know, we were trying to establish this as a, as, yeah. um, you know, conceptually. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we we tried to throw everything in. Um, arguably, at five months, people really don't need to any longer understand the randomization process. Right. Or, you know what they're, you know, a lot. There's a lot of things that can fall at the wayside, mm -hmm. but their risks and benefits, the their recourse in case they're harmed. Those types of things, I think, are maintained throughout the course of the study. So I also don't think it's, I'm oh, sorry, I also wanted to yeah. suggest, yeah. we also don't see this, I don't see this as a one-time event. So, right. you know, right. as, as consent, came out, that's, as came out years ago, right. uh, the consent process should be an ongoing, and so yeah. that's, that's, I built that into my mantra, <laughs> that right. um, we can't ever expect, uh, in any case, a one-time, maybe when you buy a car, they get away with that. Okay. But, or with loans and certain things, you know, personally, I think they should probably call you and remind you every month, your warranty is about to expire on your TV. And you realize that, you know, if you don't get that, you know, problem fixed now, you're not going to be able to do it in another month, but they don't. Right. But here we're talking about lives, uh, human lives, health, etc. So yes, Brenda. Then I, he gets on the phone and he calls someone else who I guess from at the house, the sober house, sobriety house, and says, you know, don't even waste your time coming. You don't even know if they're going to let you in the study or not. And I, you know, I couldn't, I didn't know exactly which study, yeah. but I kind of had a feeling it was one of ours in our, in our area. And I'm sitting here, I'm like, oh my God, like he's going to bat mouth the study sure. to everyone. Yeah. So I'm going to the whole treatment center, mainly because someone probably a research assistant mm -hmm. did not explain and they use the word understanding or you don't understand mm -hmm. and someone white is saying that to someone black there's a whole bunch of connotations yeah, and sure. issues that come in and I'm yeah and shame and I'm just like oh my god like it was horrible you know yeah. like, oh. and that's so when you said that I was like yeah I kind of saw that and it's just like, so again with the corrected feedback um, they're never sort of given a score uh, like you passed or you failed, the corrective feedback is more like, okay, you did, you know, you did really well. It's just a couple of items I want to go over with you. So it's more like a learning uh, process rather than a testing like process. Not being able to get it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I would say just I want to be quick because I want uh, David to, to go on because he has another another part. Yes. But uh, two things. One is that one approach has been a sliding scale approach in terms of criteria. What are the actual risks of this study? And the lower the risk, the lower the criteria needs to be in terms of, of understanding. But the, the other uh, strategy is to say, you know, I'm not sure... Uh, this, this may be best for you to participate. I'm going to give you this consent form to take home. Yes. You know what I mean? And that's, that's very respectful. I want you to understand, because I don't want you to be in something that may not be in your best interest. And I, I want you to, you know, sometimes we're presenting this too fast. And, and I, I want you to take this home, and I'm going to pay you for your transportation costs. And if you come again, I'll pay you for those transportation costs. But take this home, maybe talk to some people about it, and see if it's right for you. Yeah. David, have you ever compared your corrective feedback method, which is, here's the consent process, here's the quiz, let me go back and do that, 
to something like teach back, which occurs throughout the process, throughout the consent process, like at each topic area or or a, a paragraph? Um, because it would be yeah. interesting uh, educationally yeah. to know which is a better educational strategy, because this, a lot of this is education. No, that's a very good point. Yeah, and I, you haven't done we, that. We haven't done ahead, that, right? no. Okay. I think we technically, typically do that um, during regular consents. So yeah, and so we do, but with corrected feedback, we we kind right. of wait and then we kind yeah. of go over it with them. Yes. So uh, I appreciate the, the presentation that you just did, and you know it brings me back to the, the issues that I'm seeing in Baltimore, where people are actually making a living off of participating mm -hmm. in research, right? So with the basic informed consent, they know exactly what to say and how to pass the consent. Right. But I don't think, you know, in some cases, they really understand the risk and benefits. And then, you know, also gets me thinking about, like, health literacy and do you actually understand what those risks actually mean. So if I'm telling somebody, oh, you're at risk for hypertension, how am I sure that you know what hypertension is right. and what that even means? All you know is I need to know to say hypertension so that I can get this. Right. Out. And we try to avoid any of those, any jargon... Uh, any real technical terms. So we do focus on, uh, so we, we, we would say, you know, hyper, you know, high blood pressure condition that could be, you know, a very difficult, very, you know, harmful for you. Uh, so that's one of the risks. Uh, and so we kind of spell things out for that. But I, so in, I guess in my viewpoint, you know, in the black community, it's a little different because you're already at risk. So you're increasing your risk by participating mm -hmm. in that study, which, you know, I'm not sure how many people are actually saying that's part of it. Right, mm -hmm. that's right. Point. Yeah. But they, but they should be. So in terms of volunteeriness, yeah. uh, you know, participation obviously participation should be free from coercion and undue influence. Uh, individuals uh, with substance use disorders often have uh, certain situational factors. I told you about individuals in drug court. Um, in criminal justice settings, inpatient units, etc., where it's hard for them to not feel like, yeah, I better play along in many cases, or I don't know what's going to happen. Um, and I don't know if you guys can think about that, but if you were like, you know, in jail, locked up, and you were offered something, you, you might think that this is going to look good to the judge, this is going to have bearing on my sentencing this could affect my liberty. Um, and they may perceive that either correctly or incorrectly. One thing that we thought would be helpful was to develop a measure of coercive pressures. Now there have been other measures of coercive pressures, uh, and, and some of you might be uh, familiar with the MacArthur Admission Experience Survey that has been tailored for that um, process, but generally the the ones that are out there ask you to determine whether or not you feel coerced. You came here because you felt pressured. You came here of your own accord. You felt free to, to not uh, enter the study. And this, that information, while I guess it's helpful, <coughs> at least in determining whether or not they were coerced, they don't really get to the, the specific misperceptions or, or concerns that individuals have. And if you don't have that information, how can you address it? So what we did is we developed, again, uh, a brief 13-item measure of course of pressures. Um, I think it was also eventually truncated to 12 items that criminal justice involved substance users may experience when asked to participate in research. Uh, this uh, was done with a variety of criminal justice populations, drug courts, individuals in, in jail, individuals in prison, individuals um, you know, in uh, different uh, strategies of, inter, uh, of uh, uh, intermediate punishment, etc. But essentially we wanted it to uh, be used to enhance uh, pr um, the, the information that we would get so that we can address these issues with clients. This is just a snapshot of the, and I know these are going to be uploaded, right? Uh, so yes, yeah. so you, yeah. can, you can look at these in more detail. 
but as you can see, you know, um, I felt like I was talked into entering the study. It was entirely my choice to enter the study. I thought it would look bad to the case manager. I thought it, the judge would like it if I went in. So things, you know, are cr sort of cross, uh, as you can see, they're um, uh, cross-coded. And so essentially what we're getting out of this is who are the individuals that may make them feel coerced? And that allows us to then afterwards, maybe during the consent process, actually address these issues with clients and, and talk to them about, hey, do you understand, you know, the judge actually never sees this information. This is between us. This has to do with your understanding of your participation, and this has no bearing on your um, on what happens uh, with your case. So uh, we examined it in uh, a I believe this was a, an R twenty one grant, uh, for which I was a co PI with Karen Dugash. Uh, test retest reliability. Uh, three to five days, um, we had uh, pretty exact agreement. Uh, convergent validity, it appeared to show that um, when we looked at it uh, against the Iowa coercion questionnaire, a more general measure of coercion, uh, it had higher, CA, higher CAS scores uh, than those who did not. And we also looked at discriminative validity, discriminative validity uh, by comparing it to the Rotter's locus of control scale. So it seemed to operate and function uh, well. Um, the thought that we have is now building it into the consent process, because the consent process right, does the things we just talked about, but it really doesn't get at the, the um, sources of coercion that we really need to really evaluate uh, an individual's autonomy in a way that we can actually discuss with them the reality or, I mean, in some cases, there may be real sources of coercion. And then we have to decide whether or not we want to continue with the study, find another program, uh, have an interaction with the individuals at the, at the treatment program or at the court. You know, there's, there, there are a number of uh, those recourse we can take to address these issues. And in most cases, it, it seems to be not realistic, but just something that, an attribution that someone's making. And I don't know, again, if I was locked up and somebody came in with a lab coat and said, you know, how do you like to be in the study? You have to stand on your head for, you know, <laughs> for two minutes. And then, you know, if I, whether or not I, I would be in the position to think that you know, I probably should play along because this is probably something that would make it look like I'm compliant and I'm like being a good, you know, maybe this will help my case. So there's a lot of that that happens. We also examined in another study uh, the use of a research intermediary to improve voluntariness. So uh, they've been alternatively called ombudsmen and intermediaries, etc. But we thought that research intermediaries could be used as a way to interact with potential participants prior to them providing written informed consent. Um, they had to be perceived as independent from research, from treatment, and other involved agencies. Again, we did this in a criminal justice setting, setting with substance abusing clients. What we did is we, um, we um, took individuals We took individuals from a PsyD students from another university, so they were doctoral students. We did not reimburse them because then they would be our employees. We set up an arrangement where we were actually providing a stipend to their university, and they were doing they were being supervised by their the staff at that university, uh, and they would come in after they got the consent procedure after they were went through the informed consent process, but before they agreed to anything, before they were asked to sign, and they were told, they were introduced, the intermediary actually sat through. They were introduced to the intermediary and they were told, okay, this is Miss Smith. She is uh, here to um, observe 
she's good, uh, she's going to observe the process, uh, the consent process, and she's going to be here to answer questions and talk to you uh, afterwards, after I'm done. Then the, the research assistant would leave and leave the intermediary alone in the room with the client where they would say, look, I just want to remind you, I'm not associated with the court, with the treatment program, with the research program. I'm really only here for you. I am your representative. And so I want to be able to answer any questions you have. And if you tell me you don't want to participate in the study for any reason, that's okay. And if you're too, you know, if there's any reason you don't want to tell the person, the, the research assistant yourself, I'll, ta I'll do that for you. So, right, so all, we're addressing a number of things, right? Any kind of coercion, we're addressing uh, uh, potential per perceived coercion, we're uh, addressing this idea that, let's say some people aren't assertive enough to say no, I don't want to participate in the study. So we thought that it would be a useful technique. And we measured perceived coercion using the CAS. And I'm sorry I don't have values in here for some reason, but um, as you can see, in terms of the CAS, the um, coercion assessment scale, individuals in the intermediary group had a, a much lower level of perceived coercion. And this, again, um, calls for replication. Uh, Celia and I had some discussion about that. Mm -hmm. It's not always easy to get replication studies in this field, but mm -hmm. it, yes. Did, your, did the number of people who actually consented change? Um, the individuals who consented uh, did change, but not significantly, just slightly. Mm -hmm. And we rethought this, and if we were gonna do it again, we would do it earlier in the process. We felt that perhaps doing it right after the consent process was too a little bit too late. They may have already made up their mind. So it might have been done a little bit earlier. I would have loved to test it, uh, and I will eventually test it earlier in the process. So maybe when they're first being recruited. Uh, so very good question. Voluntariness and payment, I'm just going to go through these studies uh, relatively quickly. Some of you may be familiar with this research, but of course it's a widely held belief. And I know you have a talk about this later in the... Yeah, Brandon. Yeah. yeah. Would it, do you think it'd still be worth for me I to... I think it's worth it, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, yeah. So the voluntariness and payment, essentially, you know, we conducted a series of studies to, to test this widely held belief that you can't pay substance users or certain vulnerable populations uh, incentives for their participation. So when we did this, um, uh, and you know, we did this by uh, randomly assigning individuals to come in for a six-month follow-up. So individuals were recruited from an outpatient substance use treatment program, and they were randomly assigned. They, we did a, um, a study where we were going to examine outcomes at six months. And they were told randomly assigned to receive different modes and magnitudes of payment, okay? So you were told, for example, Celia, you were told that you were gonna receive $10 in the first study in cash. You were told that you were gonna receive $10 in gift certificate. You were told that you were gonna receive $40. You were told in gift certificate. You were told that you were gonna get $70 in in cash, et cetera, et cetera. So until we had equal, it was block randomized, so we had equal groups um, in either gift card or in cash. So we were looking at mode and magnitude of payment. When individuals came for their six month follow up, uh, first of all, we looked at whether or not they came for six month follow up. Okay, that's not the ethical question, but that's the, the sort of behavioral incentive question. Uh, but then what we did is we said, great, you're here, that's, that's great. We need to get a urine sample. And by the way, we're doing a, a satisfaction survey in three days. So we'd like you to come back. When they came back for the satisfaction survey, which everybody got $40 in a gift certificate for, uh, they were then told 
they were then said, can we reconsent you? We'd like to get another urine sample. And we got urine samples from virtually everyone because everybody wanted to make the extra money and sign up for an extra. Uh, but what we were able to do then is we kept their initial urine sample from the six month appointment. And, um, and then we compared it to this sample taken three days later. So we were able to then look to see whether or not they engage in new drug use. So obviously if they were both, if the first one was, um, was, well, if the first one was negative and the second one was positive, that's new drug use. If the first one was positive and the second one was positive, we didn't often, you know, we didn't know, but um, we did qualitative analysis on those, uh, quantitative analyses on those. So we did the, you know, uh, the guess, um, I'm blocking it. Um, yes, <laughs> on there to, exam, to examine that. Uh, and so we were able to determine that. We also asked them then about their level of coercion. And what did we find? Well, in, these were two separate studies. It was one grant and then a uh, competing renewal, uh, where we, uh, in the first study, the panel on the left, what we found is that uh, the uh, individuals in the green who received cash uh, s started off uh, with uh, experiencing some perceived coercion. Uh, I was trying to say this. Yeah, that there was no difference between in mode or magnitude on uh, perceived coercion. Uh, we don't know why this blue, you know, why they started off lower in this group. That may seem be some kind of anomaly. But essentially what we found is that over time it did increase. Uh, perceived coercion increased um, with gift certificates. And we, we don't really have an explanation for that. But it didn't seem to change at all as a function of mode or magnitude of payment. Um, whether they receive cash or, they, or whether they receive higher levels of cash. <clears throat> In the second study, we decided to raise the bar and we retained the $70 amount just to kind of see that it, you know, whether or not we had some, you know, uh, whether the study was valid, reliable. And as you can see, it continued to increase. So where in the first study, it sort of seemed to plateau or asymptote here, so that really the difference between 40 and 70 didn't really have a, a major difference. Uh, we, we hypothesized that if we went up with higher amounts, that that would break that. But importantly, you know, the, for the $70 condition um, right here, you could see that they're virtually the same in both studies which gave us a lot of confidence in, in our standardization and the reliability of our, our research. Um, but as you can see, when, by the time we got to about a $100 payment in cash, we had reached the point where we thought this was actually clinically significant, okay, not just statistically significant. Because we were now getting what the field generally wants you to get 90% follow-up rates, right? But getting 70% follow-up rates can make the difference between publishing or not publishing a study. Because if you don't get, uh, if you, if you don't get uh, representative follow-up cohorts and outcome studies, it renders your research um, often uh, non-publishable. And uh, very importantly, I, I loved what uh, Celia said yesterday about advancing the scientific process. <coughs> So here's, here's a place where we, that really rings true, right? If we want to do outcome studies, which law are largely are based on getting representative follow-up cohorts, and we want them to come in, you know, I can't tell you because when I was doing this research, I perused the literature, and you, you just, you'd be amazed if you're not already familiar with it, how many studies completely fell on their face mm -hmm. because they were unable to recruit representative follow-up cohorts. Millions and millions, probably hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars 
wasted on research, five, 10 year studies that didn't get the, uh, the follow up cohorts that they needed. So here's a way of actually improving. So there's a practical purpose for the scientific advancement is to get representative cohorts, but there's also this ethical uh, sort of belief or truism that's been, uh, we've been holding on for the longest time. And as a clinician, I'm a clinical psychologist too, I remember the days when I used to set in their, in their goals, okay, that's water, so hopefully it didn't like, create any kind of a electrical problem. Um, that we would set goals for the clients to get their first job, right? To, so when they were employed and to gain autonomy. And we would celebrate that when they achieved that goal. And sometimes that meant a two, three hundred dollar paycheck. And here we're quibbling about sometimes a seventy dollar payment for uh, individuals participating. It's very paternalistic in my uh, perspective. and. Um, it doesn't appear to, uh, as I've shown, uh, increase uh, uh, rates of new drug use. So this is where we're looking at new drug use. There seems to be no difference uh, by cash or magnitude, or mode or magnitude on the amount of new drug use, which we measured not self-report, remember, by comparing those urines. So it's very objective. And importantly, also uh, for advancing research, it reduced the number of tracking calls. So again, that behavioral question, which is, we kind of knew the answer to, the, the larger the reinforcers, the more likely they are to come into treatment. The last thing I want to present, I know I'm running over, but um, is a study that actually uh, Celia um, helped, she was on our advisory board. Uh, there was a call a few years ago, uh, PAR, uh, that was looking at <clears throat> finding new ways to identify uh, harms, social harms that may be experienced by individuals participating, participating vulnerable populations, participating, participating in uh, HIV and substance abuse research, um, who may be victims of, uh, may be uh, subject to victimization, oppression, stigmatization, etc. <coughs> And one of the things that really sort of bothers me about IRBs, besides the fact that we have to keep every signed consent form, but not a lot of people care whether or not they understood the consent form, <laughs> okay? That kind of seems a little bit confusing to me. Um, sorry, I'm up on the soapbox here. Um, but the other thing that bothers me is that we tend to find out about adverse events and social harms accidentally, right? Sometimes our research assistants are doing an assessment uh, and they find out, oh, they, they tell the PI, uh, oh, you know, they, this person, you know, was hospitalized the other day or this person was, you know, attempted suicide the other day when I was doing this, this uh, Beck inventory or whatever the case is. But there doesn't seem to be a real structured way of identifying these social harms. This is particularly important when we're, we're talking about uh, research with uh, involving HIV, um, substance use uh, disorders, um, often in countries that or in locations where uh, the, the, uh, the government, uh, the, uh, the the uh, religious uh, sort of community, uh, social uh, supports, or even the law just, just makes it sort of illegal. Uh, so I was just in the Philippines, people get executed for using drugs. And the focus, Duterte talks a lot about only killing dealers, but he also kills users. Okay, so there's research going on there. Okay, but we need to know what the harms and the risks are. And uh, one of the things, um, one of the few assessments that do exist um, is uh, for the HIV vaccine trials network, and they have the social impact assessment. But again, very similar in some ways to the coercion scale I talked about before, 
it kind of tells you more generally if somebody's been harmed or is the, the victim of social harm. But it doesn't get at the specific types of social harm. So this project sought to develop a comprehensive self-administered uh, interview, so in a CASI interview, audio, computerized, uh, um, self-administered uh, uh, interview. A CASI. I know I got that wrong somehow. But that's what it is. So you don't, it's not an interview person to person. It's an interview through the computer with headphones, very private, very easy to provide uh, information that is very sensitive in nature that you may not feel very comfortable talking about. There are people that walk home from a research program with their consent materials and copies of their stuff. They walk into their house and their significant other uh, flips out. What, is, what does that mean? They may not even be HIV positive, but they may be participating in an HIV trial. And all of a sudden, there's, you know, there's abuse potential. There's all kinds of things that can happen. Uh, people have just been seen by friends leaving a, an HIV clinic. And um, there's, uh, you know, victimization that occurs. Uh, there's being uh, sort of alienated from your social community, by your religious community, etc. So there's lots of these things that we don't pick up on. And we need to pick up on these so that we can adequately protect our clients. So um, we developed items by surveying researchers, conducting HIV-related trials. We held several focus groups with former HIV-related trial uh, research participants who had substance use disorders. And we convened a multidisciplinary expert panel, of which uh, Dr. Fisher was part of. Um, items were evaluated for clarity, et cetera. Um, and the iterative process resulted in a 12-item scale that looked at whether or not the participant experienced social harms, the frequency, the seriousness of the harm, and the way in which the study, uh, it, it was study-related. And this is the, uh, the uh, Cassia SHQ. <clears throat> I was told that there are a couple glitches in the uh, typos in this, but uh, you do have it in your, uh, you should have it in your downloads. Mm -hmm. So what did we find? We found that participants were um, generally, we had 79 individuals uh, with substance use disorders participating in one of two HIV-related trials. Uh, participants completed the ACASI SHQ and HVTN SIA, which we talked about, um, at months one, two, and three post the host study. Okay, so this is done on top of a host study. We counterbalanced the order at which the scales were administered and survey data about perceptions of feasibility and acceptability from the, um, from the study participants and the research team were collected. In terms of acceptability to participants, um, it, of the 64 clients that completed the satisfaction assessment, 92% uh, found reported that they found it to be acceptable. Uh, and they thought it was useful. In terms of the acceptability for research staff, also of the four members of the research team that completed the feasibility study, no respondents indicated disagreement to the statement um, of the following statement. And generally it seemed very positive, it was easy to use, reported that it didn't really disrupt their research procedures, uh, and it was very straightforward. And looking at the the figure uh, at the bottom, you can see here that uh, the SHQ picked up many more social harms than the um, SIA. And when we look at the types of harms that were identified, um, this had to do with problems in living um, arrangements, problems with employment, uh, problems with coworkers, and problems with neighbors. Now this was done in a local study at the University of Pennsylvania with a colleague of ours, Robbie Schnoll, who's doing tobacco research with HIV clients. And we did this also in our HIV <coughs> trial in drug courts. So there were two, two host studies. 
this type of, in, of assessment is even better suited for, um, for programs that not in Philadelphia, but research programs that are being done in locations, as I mentioned earlier, where there may be really strict uh, draconian laws against um, being homosexual, about, the, uh, about HIV, uh, and a, a number of other uh, things that uh, maybe are a little bit less stigmatized here and with less risk of oppression or victimization. In conclusion, substance abusers present uh, unique challenges. Uh, research has provided useful strategies to help improve the consent process and the identification of social harms. Uh, I think that uh, we all share a common interest. I think, as I mentioned yesterday, I think that for too long, uh, research, these kinds of research questions were relegated to uh, armchair debate and rhetoric, and it's, you know, it's uh, the last 15 or 20 years, as Celia mentioned yesterday, really has been a, uh, finally, you know, after how long since the Belmont Report and the Nuremberg Trials and everything, are we actually looking at these things through empirical uh, lenses? And um, I think that we could find ways to improve human subject protections, but also advance science, as, uh, as Celia mentioned. Thank you.